130 years ago, Brazil experienced one of its most important revolutions, or coups, if you will. On November 15, 1889, military leaders and financial elites conspired to overthrow Emperor Pedro II. This marked the first official foray of the military into the center stage of Brazilian politics, an arena which they are never too far away from. But the proclamation of Brazil's republic is just one of a series of revolts, coups, and attempted revolutions that Brazil has witnessed throughout its history. As a matter of fact, breaking with the established order, or at least attempting to do so, has been a constant in Brazil, from colonial times to as recently as the 1970s, when then-military president Ernesto Geisel dissolved Congress in order to pass the reforms his administration wanted. Today, we're going to talk about that, well, tradition in Brazilian political life. My name is Gustavo Ribeiro, editor-in-chief of the Brazilian Report, and this is Explaining Brazil. Joining me today is Claudio Couto, professor and head of the Public Policy and Management Master's Program at Fundação Getúlio Vargas and a columnist for the Brazilian Report. Hi, Claudio. Thanks for being back to our podcast. Hi, Gustavo. It's a pleasure to be here again. Claudio, political turmoil seems to be the rule rather than the exception in Brazil. I mean, in 2010, Lula became only the only democratically elected president who was handed power by another democratically elected president and who then passed the torch to a third consecutive democratically elected president without any coups, death, impeachment or resignation getting in the way. Why is that? Well, I think that the uh, Brazilian political system historically is a very unstable one. When we consider the precedent democratic period in Brazil before the military coup of 1964, uh, what we had at that time was uh, a, a, a first president, uh, Eurico Gaspar Dutra, who was the former uh, war minister of Getúlio Vargas, but that was at the same time responsible for removing Getúlio Vargas from the power. And after him, Getúlio Vargas himself, after being seized from the power, was elected, but he suicided. And so, uh, and why he suicided? He suicided because there was a terrible political turmoil at that time. And Vargas, to avoid a, a coup at that time, perhaps a military coup at that time, he preferred to suicide. After him, Je uh, uh, Juscelino Kubitschek was elected. He almost didn't took off seat. For Juscelino to take off, it was necessary a military intervention in terms of uh, assuring the, that the constitution would be followed. He uh, was a, an elected president that passed the torch for another one for Jânio Quadros. But Jânio Quadros resigned, and after resigning, vice president actually at that time, uh, João Goulart took off, but João Goulart was removed by the military coup. After the military dictatorship, who had perhaps more stability, But even though we have not that stability, not such a stability, we have a, a situation in which the, 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 the president were also challenged either by the military, like during Governo Sarney, when the military was, were always present there, or uh, they were challenged by the, the, the streets, like Collor, who was in picture, or like Dilma after him, who was in picture. And of all these problems and... Uh... Of all these uh, moments of political instability, one thing seems to be constant is the presence of the military, either removing the president like they did in, uh, in the case of Getúlio Vargas in 1945 or with João Goulart in 1964, or by, like you said, uh, avoiding a coup from happening like in the case of Juscelino Kubitschek. The, the, the military doing the empire, doing the monarchy, It was a less politicized institution, but in, re in the Republic, it was never very far from the political limelight. Well, I think that during the monarchy period, during the, the empire, the military were really absent from the political scenery. They finally uh, entered into the political scenery during the war of Brazil and Argentina against Paraguay. 
in that moment, the military became really important. We had some of these uh, uh, military leaders transform it into uh, important political leaders or actu- uh, or at least national uh, leaders, like the, the, the one that would be responsible for the declaration of the Republic in Brazil in the end of 19th century, removing the emperor from his throne. Uh, I mean, Marechal Deodoro da Fonseca. And uh, why the military became so important in the end of the monarchic period? because they considered that they were not really recognized by the monarchy for the role that they performed during the war against Paraguay. After that, and after taking the power for the two first presidencies in Brazil, uh, the military became relatively absent from the political scenery. We, we had the tendency. Yeah, yeah, but in 1930, in 1930, we had this movement from the, the lieutenants in the army, uh, and that's why the, the, the movement was called tenantismo, that is, a movement from the tenants. They were uh, low rank officials, they were reformers, and they were against the civilian but oligarchic regime that we had in Brazil during the first uh, uh, 40 years of the Brazilian Republic, since 1889 until 1930. And why that? Because it was not only a very corrupt system, but uh, the elections were fraudulent at that time. And so these tenants, they provided support for Getúlio Vargas, firstly as a presidential candidate in an alternative slate, and after that as the leader of a, uh, of a coup, not exactly a military coup, but a coup that was supported by some sections of the military, initially the tenants, and after them the higher officials that were uh, the real supporters of the Tulio Vargas regime since 1930 until 1945. We have this presence of the military in a lot of these revolutions, in a lot of these coups. Another common trait, uh, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, but it is the fact that almost or all of these movements, at least the ones that worked, were movements of the elites, and the people had little to say. I mean, the proclamation of the republic in 1889, um, there are historical accounts that some people thought it was a military parade, and only after they were reading the papers that they realized uh, that power had changed, we, had no long, we no longer had an emperor. So uh, what does it say about Brazilian society, the fact that all of these movements are movements of the elites, by the elites, and discussed only among the elites? This is a very good question. Well, we can say that the inauguration of the Republic in Brazil was a very elitistic movement, a movement from the military themselves, and also uh, from some sectors of the rural elites of the country, of the economic elites. We had no popular participation in that movement. It was not even necessary People were astonished. They didn't know exactly what was going on, but they just accepted. But uh, it was a movement in which there was a real alliance between the military and the Brazilian oligarchies, the Brazilian economic and regional political elites. After that, we had 1930 that was called a revolution. Many people uh, contest that, say, wow, it was not a revolution because it came from a both. Well, but some revolutions really come from above. And perhaps 1930, since it changed so deeply the Brazilian political scenario, the Brazilian economic scenario, the Brazilian state, it can be perhaps deemed as a, a revolution. We can see that Vargas in 1930, Vargas was a kind of Brazilian version of Otto von Bismarck in Germany, because Vargas was responsible not only to pacify the clashes between different sectors of the agricultural oligarchies, but also Getúlio Vargas was responsible for framing the modern Brazilian state and also to establish uh, a conservative version of a a welfare state in the tropics, only for urban workers, but uh, a version of a, 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 a conservative welfare state, somewhat like Bismarck did in Germany. And the military at that time was very important support of that. In 1964, on the other hand, the military called that a revolution. Other people just say that it was a coup. 
even they call the regime a revolution, whereas other people call the regime a dictatorship. And so the word revolution has a positive meaning, and this is why the perpetrators of such uh, political ruptures, they call that revolution. Even in the Institutional Act that tried to legalize the military dictatorship in Brazil, it was the first uh, legal act that they enacted. They say that a revolution legitimizes itself. Have you already had a revolution? I mean, because we have the impression here in Brazil that everything is smooth, negotiated, controlled. So have we ever had a true revolution? I wouldn't say that. Even 1930, well, we can say that we had a considerable transformation in 1930. But uh, to say that it is a real revolution, I would believe that uh, it would be too much. <laughs> I, I can say that what we have is a, a deep conservative transformation. And we had that in 1930, we had that not so deep in 1889 when the Republic was inaugurated, and we had it again in 1964. Deep conservative transformations at most, never a revolution. Now I have two questions within one. Uh, the mm-hmm. first part of it is, is our democracy now solid enough to stand ground against a movement like that? And uh, Bolsonaro was democratically elected. He promised more military men in the government, and apparently he will deliver that. Today, uh, we're recording this podcast on Tuesday, November 13. He announced uh, a retired general for the Ministry of Defense, for instance. So what does having more military men in power in a country with Brazil's history mean? To answer the first question initially... Uh, I have doubts about how solid is the Brazilian democracy today. I believe that we have somewhat strong institutions in what regard institutional controls, but uh, almost all of these institutions are under popular scrutiny today, and people don't rely on them. People don't trust on the Congress, for example. They don't trust on political parties that could be checked on the presidency. People have doubts about how the judicial system works, except from some specific justices that are seen by many people as uh, a kind of uh, judicial heroes, like uh, Sergio Moro, that was appointed by Bolsonaro to be his minister of justice. Uh, But people don't believe truly in institutions as a whole. Of course, we have a, a press that is independent from the government, some of them not totally independent, but independent in terms of not being directly controlled by the state. And this is a very important check on the, on the public administration. Well, we can say that we have some checks, some uh, limits for the, the, the president and from his supporters to run the country. But I'm not sure about how strong they are, even the, the Supreme Court, how much stronger it is to enforce its statement. Uh, on the other hand, Bolsonaro, of course, he's not a democratic leader. He's, uh, instead of that, I can I believe that Bolsonaro is the typical case of a new fascist, uh, a politician that is in favor of authoritarian solutions. He praises political violence. He sees his political adversaries as enemies. And many of the people in the, his inner circle think exactly like that. Perhaps he's an autocratic leader in terms of his perceptions of politics, about his intentions, but uh, an autocratic leader that could be controlled. By whom? Perhaps by the traditional institutions of a democracy and, paradoxically perhaps, by some sectors of the military. I believe that members of the military, or the military hierarchy itself, they are very conservative, but they are perhaps more pragmatic and more rational than Bolsonaro and his inner circle. I don't know, I'm not sure if they really want or if they will still uh, uh, remain wanting if something happens in this country that goes farther from what the military would expect. And for that reason, when Bolsonaro appoints a a general for minister of defense, well, initially, he is going against uh, uh, the idea of what a minister of defense should be, because the idea of a ministry of defense is to have civilian control over the military. But when you have a member of the military there, well, you don't have this control. 
Besides that, or in addition to this, this member of the military is a member of the army. And uh, a member of the army has to, to be the boss of members of the Navy and of the Air Force. And, of course, it creates some split inside the military, some insatisfaction inside that. This is an additional problem. We'll see uh, Jair Bolsonaro takes office on January the 1st, and we will be there following his administration. Claudio, thank you very much for once again joining us in our podcast. Okay, Gustavo, it's a pleasure. When we want, we can talk again. If you like this podcast, please take a look at our website. It's Brazilian.report. Every day we have new content about Brazil's politics, economics, and society. We also have exclusive newsletter services if you want to be briefed on what's going on in Brazil before starting your day. Subscribe now to our free trial and enjoy all of our content for 14 days. And it's really free. You don't have to put any credit card information. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Our handle is at Brazilian Report. That's all for now. See you next week. Mm-hmm.